Hello everybody and welcome to the Vancouver Island Trauma Discussion Part 2. Glad you could join us after the first part. Maybe you came back and you're just waiting for the cool part or the dancing. Uh, there is none of that, fortunately. But there is some good discussion on trauma. So what we're going to get into this time is we're going to jump into a look at the Vancouver Island Trauma Triage Algorithm, which is really just a graphical uh, format to take a look at the stuff we talked about in part one and how we're going to apply it to our cases of major trauma around the island. Following that, we will get into some regional, in some case, station-specific discussions on how to apply these guidelines to our patients. And we'll sort of intertwine that with some examples or bring some up at the end just to make sure that most people's questions are hopefully answered and that everyone has a good idea of how we're going to proceed with trauma on the island going forward. So with that said, let's jump right into a look at the algorithm. So in jumping in and talking about the trauma triage algorithm, you'll notice that the first thing it mentions is failed airway. And there's a little superscript there saying, hey, take a look at the note at the bottom. With a failed airway, it says transport to the nearest emergency department. And that makes sense. At the bottom, what it does is it starts to define what a failed airway really is, and it's the inability to maintain airway patency by any means. What this means is if you can oxygenate and ventilate, you do not have a failed airway. If you, for instance, your supraglottic device wasn't working and you take it out and you revert to two-person BVM with an OPA or an NPA in place and you get some chest rise, even with potentially a fluid airway, you still don't have a failed airway. You're able to move air and you're able to oxygenate that patient. If you can't do any of those things, then sure, you have a failed airway and you should go to the nearest, nearest emergency room for assistance in securing that airway. But what you need to keep in mind in making decisions to transport to the nearest emergency room is that you are letting go of all the stuff we talked about in the first part, all of the advantages of getting to a lead trauma hospital. Because as soon as we go into a, a clinic or a, a smaller hospital, it does tend to slow down that patient's journey in getting to the trauma facility that they need. And I think we have potentially all maybe seen that where, where there can be delays in transport and getting people out. Um, and that is one of the main reasons why you have this push to, the, to these new 90 minute um, transport guidelines is to get people where they need to go and try to avoid some of these delays. So if you do have a true failed airway where you can't oxygenate or ventilate no matter what you do, whether it's BVM or supraglottic device, OPA, NPA, suctioning, none of that's working, by all means go to the nearest emergency department. But if you can move air, even if it's not, you know, the way you would like to do it, uh, potentially, you know, it's just not working nicely with a supraglottic device, then you should still be transporting to a lead trauma hospital. And put some of those tools in place. Make sure you're communicating that you have airway difficulty. The hospital would love to know that. You know, get an ACP or CCP crew coming. Certainly get another crew coming if that's not available to help you out and assist. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for that help. Once we talk about the failed airway part of it, the algorithm gets into uh, cardiac arrest. So it talks about blunt traumatic arrest um, and suggests that we contact EPOS for discontinue orders. In this case, we know that blunt cardiac arrest is basically non-survivable, and that's why that's there. In penetrating trauma, there is a chance if you're really close to a hospital that's going to perform an emergency surgical procedure like a thoracotomy, that somebody with penetrating uh, traumatic arrest might be, might be able to pull through if you get them there within 15 minutes. That's, that's a pretty tight timeline for some places on the island for sure. But it's something to keep in the back of your mind, depending on where the call is and what, what the nature of it is. Once we talk about the cardiac arrest, we get into sort of the nuts and bolts of what we talked about in part one, which is starting to look at the physiological, anatomical, and mechanism parts. So under physiological, all it says is, hey, if you have these signs, somebody with a GCS of 13 or less, um, hypotension like a systolic less than 90, or a ventilatory rate of less than 10 or greater than 30, or needing ventilatory support, hey, those patients need to go to a lead trauma hospital. And it's saying go for it if that lead trauma hospital is accessible within 90 minutes. If it's not within 90 minutes, then you would probably go to your closest hospital. And we'll deal with some examples as we get into that part of it. 
Uh, same with the anatomical. Once we go through the physiological part, this algorithm is just prompting you to now look at the anatomical part that we reviewed in part one as well and saying, hey, if you have these things, same rules. Go to your lead trauma hospital if it's within 90 minutes. As it gets into um, the part three, which is the mechanism of injury and the special considerations, this is where you'll notice it starts to say consider and consult. And this is what we talked about in part one as well, is take all that information in, have a good discussion with your partner, look at the mechanism and look for special situations for when transport might be warranted to a lead trauma hospital, despite the lack of physiological or anatomical findings, because those things could be hidden or masked and might present later. And certain patient populations are at risk. We don't have time to go into everything, obviously, in this video, but it's certainly something that myself or any of the educators would be happy to talk to you about um, uh, at another time. So in this case, I'd highly recommend talking to a paramedic specialist, clinical, EPOS, and getting some insight if you're really not sure if, it's, if you should be transporting your patient to a lead trauma hospital or not. And that's kind of the nuts and bolts of the algorithm. It's just taking you through that decision-making progress, progress process that we talked about before. So by all means, um, take a look at the algorithm. Uh, you don't have to commit the entire thing to memory. It's going to be easily accessible to you. But please keep it in the back of your mind that that is there for, to help you work through these major trauma cases. So with that being said, I think it's time we jump into actually looking at how this breaks down region by region, station by station. So let's go ahead and jump right into taking a look. Uh, we're going to start in the south. So we'll jump right into how trauma looks in Victoria and then go out from there. So starting to discuss trauma in the Victoria area is actually probably the easiest place to start. Not a lot of changes are going to really happen here. Um, there's not a lot of auto launch that goes on in downtown Victoria. And for the most case, you have uh, PCP and or ACP um, support in transporting patients to the trauma center. I guess the only thing that I would reiterate from what we talked about in part one is that you want to consider um, if you're looking between the Jubilee and Victoria General is consider those special um, cases and consider mechanism of injury when making a decision about how to transport. Just because somebody has a short fall, if they're elderly or at higher risk, they still might qualify for an actual trauma assessment and perhaps should be taken to Victoria General Hospital. Otherwise, in Victoria proper, there's not really any change from these, uh, from these guidelines, so you can kind of carry on as normal. And with that, I think we will move on to the next area to cover, and that will be the Gulf Islands. So as we look into what to do uh, if we're on the Southern Gulf Islands, um, it's important to recognize that this guideline doesn't really change much for you. I think it's fair to say that um, if there is major trauma on the Southern Gulf Islands, an air response is generally what, uh, what we prefer. It's what everybody would like to see happen, probably including the patient. Um, but oftentimes air isn't available or can't fly due to weather. So while the 90 minute guideline to get them to Victoria General might not really be feasible and you'll probably end up transporting to your local clinic or on Salt Spring the hospital. It's important to remember on uh, these Gulf Islands that the same concepts still apply, right? We still want to do everything with an eye towards getting these people to where they need to be. And that's where the things like communication really come into play, making sure dispatch knows what you're dealing with, what the situation is, and that they can start advocating and working behind the scenes to get your patient off the island as quickly as possible if an air response isn't uh, isn't going to be forthcoming. So uh, not much else to say on the Southern Gulf Islands, um, but, uh, you know, hopefully you guys can uh, take some lessons out of this and hope to um, improve the way that we deal with major trauma patients to keep them, keep everything moving those people towards the facilities that they need to be in. So um, sorry, there's not more to say for the Southern Gulf Islands, but uh, now we're gonna take a look over at areas outside of Victoria, but down in the South Island. So in looking at areas on the South Island outside of Victoria, we consider places like uh, Sydney, Mill Bay, uh, Souk, 
these are places where it's not a lot of change there either. Yeah, they're farther out from Victoria proper, but I would imagine that most trauma patients from those areas end up going to Victoria General anyway. So same thing is, you know, maybe take the lessons from here that we can consider. We always want to make sure that we are asking for help if we need it, uh, even if it's only, oh, it's only 25 minutes away. Maybe having some help in the back would have some uh, added benefit and uh, good communication can really help. So no real guideline changes, just um, just please consider some of the stuff that we've covered uh, to help um, maybe make your care of the trauma patient a little bit smoother. Uh, in the same area, or not the same area, uh, obviously, is we get out to Port Renfrew. And when we get out there, we start to get pretty far away. And while we might be starting to push 90 minutes to get to a hospital, depending on where the call comes in, I think it's important to recognize that the 90 minutes is a guideline and 90 minutes wasn't made with Vancouver Island in mind. So our geography will sort of trump anything that kind of comes out of it. But the same, um, the same factors and the same motivators still exist. We want to get this patient to the right place. From Port Renfrew, there's kind of nowhere else to go until you get to Victoria General anyways. But the lessons about communication, because the communication is poor, so when you have it, make sure you're asking for everything you might need. You guys know this, but I think it's just bears repeating that, um, you know, better to over ask for things when you need them and get them on the way than not have them if the situation changes. <clears throat> so, you know, if you want ACP to start out there, you know, try and get them started when you do have communication, even if you're not 100 percent sure if you'll need them because you have a long way to go. And, you know, you're going to be transporting to Victoria General anyways, so even if um, you had to get another PCP crew, that's just fine as well uh, to meet you if ACP isn't available or is going to be delayed for 45 minutes or whatever, then by all means get the help coming towards you. I think that's quite reasonable. And if you're outside of the 90 minutes, you're in the two hour range, these people still need to get there. You still, you don't have a closer option, so uh, aiming for Victoria General is still the way to go. And again, of course, air is, is, uh, is first up there as well. But um, if air isn't available, then we're looking at this 90 minute transport time. So uh, by all means, head for Victoria General and ask for the help you need. So yeah, uh, after that, I think we'll start moving north on the island and uh, head on over to the Cowichan Valley. So things start to get a little more interesting once we head up north and into the Cowichan Valley. Uh, when we talk about um, a 90 minute transport time, assuming air isn't available and coming to, to transport in the absence of having, having that option, 90 minutes starts to become a factor as we get farther out, of, uh, farther out of Victoria. So when we look at the map of the catchment area, roughly of what we're talking about, we can see that um, the Cowichan Valley is a little bit expanded. And here, uh, even though, yes, it's not strictly the Cowichan Valley, we're including uh, Shimanus and Ladysmith in this as well. The reason is, is because the cutoff boundary that we're going to use for trauma heading south versus heading north to Nanaimo is going to be the same as what we're using for stroke and for patients who are uh, fast band positive. So we're going to use South Cedar Road uh, south of uh, Nanaimo as the cutoff for where patients are going to start heading south to Victoria General versus north to Nanaimo. And what that does is that um, it does prolong the transport time, but what it does is it gets you to the next level of lead trauma hospital, a level two versus a level three. So there's some trade-offs in play there. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, about that. But for now, let's step back and let's go down towards the Duncan area. I think for crews at 52, I think it's pretty obvious that um, VGH can be uh, can be um, arrived at in easily in less than 90 minutes for sure, um, probably less than an hour depending on where the call is to get your patient there. Bypassing Cowichan District uh, might be new to some people, a little bit scary. This is sort of where we start to push the boundary a bit on on taking patients for a longer period of time to get them to a lead trauma hospital. But I think that a lot of people have seen where, where patients are delayed in getting where they need to be sometimes. And hopefully this is gonna to help to stop um, those delays. And <clears throat> while CDH um, does well in a number of things, major trauma isn't really their specialty. Uh, that's why these patients need to be going to Victoria General. Uh, I would, this also becomes pretty relevant when we talk about 119 in Lake Cowichan. Um, 
for people working out in Lake Cowichan, they already have, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever to get to CDH for their trauma patient. Now what we're doing is we're pushing that to Victoria General as well. So generally any patient from the Lake Cowichan area will be going to Victoria General Hospital and bypassing Cowichan District. The same rules apply, um, you know, failed airway, the stuff we talked about before, then you might stop at CDH if that was, if that was truly the case. But these patients are gonna be better served by getting to Victoria General in a timely manner. So that's a lot to ask of the crews. And again, comes back to communicate and ask for the help and be assured in your skill set and what you can do. If you need help from a PCP crew out of Duncan while you're heading in, by all means, call for them. Um, you know, ask dispatch or dispatch has probably already thought of it. If you if you let them know you have a major trauma and you'll be bypassing to start an ECP resource out of Victoria to meet you somewhere north of the Malahat and to help you out with that transport. All of those are great options and you should certainly avail yourself of, of any help you can get uh, to take care of that patient. When we talk about uh, Shimanus and Ladysmith, the same thing applies is that um, these are probably within an hour and a half of Victoria General pretty easily for any calls that are going on up there. And if you have that major trauma patient, you might initially be tempted to say, well, Nanaimo's closer and it's a lead trauma hospital. But at some point, we have to put a boundary in, in play to say we want to get to a, the highest level lead trauma hospital we can. So while we're accepting a slightly longer transport time, we're doing that to get to Victoria General versus Nanaimo. And in terms of picking a cutoff for that, what we have is we have a um, we want to keep the boundary the same as strokes just for simplicity's sake. And you know that's generally considered to be reasonable by medical programs and by the educators and everyone who's had, who's had input into this. Um, of course, there's lots of lots of discussion has been had about this, trust me, so I can understand any arguments against it. But the direction is going to be that for major trauma patients south of Cedar Road, they will be heading to Victoria General as well and bypassing both Nanaimo and Cowichan District Hospital. And again, get an ACP resource coming, maybe 180 can meet up with you by ground if that's the case, if they're in striking distance, if air isn't available, obviously, then we'll be doing that. So, so to sum it up for the Cowichan area, we're getting rid of what used to be a cutoff, maybe at Bench Road or something for trauma going south versus going north. And pretty much any trauma patient in the Cowichan area uh, we'll be heading down to Victoria General instead of CDH or to Nanaimo. So yeah, that's where it is for uh, that case. And next we will head on up to Nanaimo proper and then on up to Oceanside. So as we push north, we start to get into some more unique situations. Nanaimo itself, not much is going to change. You're going to have your normal response to trauma in an urban setting. You'll be You'll be transporting. Um, you'll be transporting to Nanaimo Hospital like you normally would. An argument could be made, or I've heard it mentioned. Well, hey, I can get to Victoria General within ninety minutes, uh, and that that might be true. But if we consider the main differences and factors between going to Victoria versus Nanaimo in terms of a lead trauma hospital level two or level three, Nanaimo still has most of the things we're interested in, like a uh, organized trauma system. Uh, the access to surgery is huge, as well as a massive transfusion protocol for blood. A lot of that is already already in place in Nanaimo. Um, so the extra transport to Victoria in that case probably doesn't provide a lot of added benefit um, where we're looking at pushing that boundary. And yes, if you're down south and you're really close to the cutoff, that might be worth considering the clinical cause and what's going on. Um, for instance, neurosurgery uh, is not going to be available in Nanaimo but would be in Victoria. So I, I would certainly advocate a phone call to the paramedic specialist or the EPOS to have a chat about potentially going to Victoria if you're somewhere on the boundary. But for the most part, trauma should be going to Nanaimo Hospital if you're north of Cedar Road and certainly in Nanaimo proper. As we push up into Oceanside, um, the same, same rules apply that trauma would normally be coming to Nanaimo. Obviously, we're not gonna take trauma to Oceanside Clinic. Um, so as as it currently would be all those cases are going to be going to NRGH anyways where it starts to get more interesting is when we start to get up towards Cameron Lake uh, out towards Port Alberni or we get further north uh, say north of Bowser and up to closer to Courtney now we have some 
decisions to make because previously, depending on where you were, you may have chosen to go to the closest hospital, which might have been West Coast General in Port Alberni or to, um, to uh, Courtney. And in terms of going to those hospitals now, the changing guidelines is really advocating uh, for us to transport all those patients down to NRGH, despite maybe being closer to those other hospitals and for all the reasons that we've already covered. What I would advocate for here is that we're looking at longer transport times. So let's make sure that that communication, that asking for help is really in the front of our minds because we can start to get some additional resources like, um, like ACP out of Nanaimo coming to areas where they might not have traditionally been sent as we push farther out of Nanaimo. And certainly the CCP resource, if it was an auto launch and air wasn't available and the helicopter can't come, Hopefully we'd be seeing the CCP resource sent anyways, but if they're not, if they were tied up or if things change, by all means be asking for these resources. And again, any help you need in the back is definitely advocated for. So that sort of takes care of Nanaimo and the Oceanside area. Um, the one area that I haven't mentioned yet, uh, last but not least I suppose, is Gabriel Island. And again, uh, like the Southern Gulf Islands, air is preferable if at all possible. There is a clinic to stop in for some quick stabilization, but uh, like before, consider getting some ACP or CCP resources over there by, by water if, if possible. And transporting to Nanaimo is still a pretty great way to go. We don't want to get necessarily get bogged down uh, on the island in, in doing some things where we could be transporting that patient. So it can be a case by case basis. And for areas where the logistics get trickier, I think a call to the paramedic specialist is a great idea. But remember, you guys are the experts in where you live. So definitely um, take advantage of that recommendation part of an SBAR. So now we'll uh, jump over to uh, the West Coast, get into Port Alberni and Tofino and have a little chat. Now things certainly start to get interesting as we get out to uh, Port Alberni in the West Coast. And it's important to uh, have a good discussion around what happens in the Port Alberni area for the uh, 124 crews. Um, traditionally, trauma would be brought to West Coast General um, pretty much from anywhere within Port Alberni proper. And then arrangements would be made um, subsequent to that to transfer the patient out if necessary. This is of course if an auto launch to the scene wasn't available. And oftentimes the helicopter would um, perhaps even just do a hospital intercept. What we're going for now is we're going for direct transport for the patients from Port Alberni to Nanaimo Hospital. Now this is a long way and um, some of the boundaries have been um, defined in terms of where we want to go for. In When you look at the capture area, what we're going to be going for for Port Alberni is anything east of the Sprout River. Uh, where Brand Avenue is, um, as you can see on this, uh, this little map that I put together here, just as a general idea, this is all a capture for NRGH for major trauma. And looking back to the algorithm, if you have that, uh, you know, that penetrating trauma, you can get to West Coast within 15 minutes for a traumatic arrest, so be it. Um, or if you have a true failed airway where you cannot oxygenate and ventilate no matter what you do, then West Coast would be your choice. Failing that though, if it's a major trauma by the physiological anatomical standards or you decide it should go to a lead trauma hospital, Nanaimo is the hospital you should be shooting for. And like we talked about, like I've said many times, communication is important and asking for help. Getting 180 started out of Nanaimo is certainly an option. Um, at least for now, you know, they're uh, days only, uh, 730 to 1930. Um, and having ACP intercept out of Nanaimo is also quite reasonable. I mean, if you're bringing a sick, traumatic patient that's so bad we need to bypass to a trauma hospital from far away because we know that's better, why wouldn't we get some help coming in terms of some um, additional license level support or even some additional help if needed? So that's certainly um, advocated for, certainly encouraged to see that you guys are getting that help as you bring somebody in. As we move farther west, um, it starts to get a little trickier, of course, trauma in the in the west coast, in the tofino Euclid area has always been a little bit tricky. The decision there um, has to be a bit of a compromise given given the timelines. And what, what we're gonna put into place for a guideline 
is to say that anything that occurs east of the junction of Highway 4 as you come into uh, the West Coast, anything east of there, you know, Kennedy Lake between, um, between the junction and Port Alberni would be going to West Coast General Hospital because you can make that within 90 minutes. You won't be able to get to Nanaimo uh, within 90 minutes and West Coast can offer some support for trauma patients on, on its, uh, it would be considered a level four uh, hospital. So for that subset of patients between the junction and, uh, you know, Port Alberni, uh, then those patients would be going to West Coast General if that's where the incident had occurred uh, between, I guess, basically between the junction and Sproul Lake, uh, Sproul River. So for anybody in Euclid or Tofino proper that has a traumatic injury, those patients will still go to Tofino Hospital. Uh, it's not reasonable to try to make West Coast General in, in the timelines necessarily, but what we are encouraging is definitely more communication, consideration of auto launch, and even I think we'll start to push for early fixed wing activation where if a helicopter isn't available, maybe we should be looking at it, getting a fixed wing resource in there um, as soon as possible, get them launched on their way to transport that patient out of Tofino because we know Tofino uh, is limited in what it can offer for trauma care and we wanna be able to get these patients where they need. Tofino doesn't have any surgical capability and it's quite limited in its blood supply. So getting those patients out is key. And as crew members from 36 and 34, you guys can really help by making sure that communication is awesome and getting that, um, getting that message out to dispatch that this is what's going on. So that's kind of the uh, Port Alberni and West Coast area in a nutshell. Now we'll just um, truck on up to the Comox Valley and talk about that and then move north and wrap this up. Getting up into the Comox Courtney area, um, we start to push that 90 minute boundary again for NRGH. And the cutoff, the designated cutoff point for trauma going north is actually gonna be Ham Road around Black Creek. So north of Courtney, Comox, Cumberland area. So major trauma from Ham Road South, uh, from Courtney Comox proper, should preferentially be transported to Nanaimo as the lead trauma hospital, assuming an air response isn't, uh, isn't happening or isn't intercepting, or that you don't have a failed airway like we talked about before. So for the 50 and 51 crews or any crew in that area, that major trauma should be going south. And the same things apply to ask for help and get, uh, get ACPs out of Nanaimo or CCP out of Nanaimo to come and intercept um, and offer what they can to assist you um, or a PCP crew if, if you need it. It's certainly encouraged to get that help. Uh, that would also include Mount Washington uh, should preferentially be going to NRGH as well. Now, um, when we talked, we haven't talked specifically about Denman and Hornby, but for the 71 crews, um, <clears throat> not much is gonna change for you guys. If you have major trauma, again, hopefully a helicopter is available. If not, and you're transporting by ferry, um, or maybe water taxi is uh, you know getting there. It'll it'll more be up to communication with the receiving crew uh, by ground, and they should probably also be preferentially going to Nanaimo Hospital. And a call to the PS or EPOS might be warranted if you're already pushing 90 minutes from the time of incident. By the time you get over to to Vancouver Island, then um, you might want to have that discussion. But generally, NRGH will be the way to go rather than rather than shooting north. So that sums it up for there. Ham Road South for the 5051 crews. And uh, next, we're just going to head on up to Campbell River and talk about that area. So, Campbell River uh, for the 108 crews is fairly self explanatory, I think. Campbell River will be a receiving hospital just based on geography. It's, it's starting, I mean, obviously, that's starting to get pretty far uh, outside of Nanaimo. So, Ham Road North uh, would be going to Campbell River. Obviously, Campbell River proper trauma from there would go to Campbell River Hospital as well. Um, as we go north, uh, any trauma up towards Sayward and the border will be out to Wass. Uh, going up the highway would also warrant a trip down to Campbell River. And I think that makes sense. It's not a big change from what you do now, but just to reiterate that. When we go west towards Gold River, um, Gold River, wherever the call is, may or may not be within 90 minutes. If you can make it within 90 minutes to Campbell River Hospital, you should be pushing for that. And by all means, ask for some support and some help out of Campbell River if possible. 
if you can't make it and and think you should go to Gold River um, Hospital, then that's fine. Feel free to go there. But uh, just keep in mind that if you can make that transport to Campbell River, it's probably the best thing for the patient to get to a higher level hospital. Getting out towards Tassis, you guys are in a bit of a tricky situation. Um, you're not going to obviously make it to Campbell River in 90 minutes from Tassis. You don't have a large volume of calls out there and major trauma, but if you do, I think it, the discussion you're going to have to have amongst yourselves and hopefully with a paramedic specialist or EPOS is whether you go to the clinic and wait for some evacuation or help in Tassis or head for Gold River. Heading for Gold River um, kind of offers some extra support in terms of um, the facility and what they can provide as well as some extra help from the 55 crew. So it might be worth considering the drive to Gold River with your trauma patient for sure. Plus air uh, evacuation might be more feasible out of Gold River as well, depending on the weather or whatever is going on. Uh, last, uh, Quadrant Cortez. Not much is gonna change for you guys. I think air would be preferred, but you guys are pretty far north. So you will have to rely on pretty much your normal situation now. But again, asking for that help, you never know who might be available. So putting it to dispatch that you need some help for a quick evacuation or some additional medical support is a never a bad idea to uh, use that communication and try to, get, uh, try to get the patient to Campbell River as best you can if air isn't coming. So that's that area and uh, we'll just head up to the north. So last but not least, we come to the North Island. Um, this area is fairly self-explanatory. Obviously, we're not gonna make it to one of the lead trauma hospitals we've already talked about. And this is going to apply to stations from uh, Port Hardy, McNeil, Port Alice, uh, Swantula and Alert Bay, um, although of course that's a little bit different, uh, as well as Zabalis. So for all those stations, the lead trauma hospital to which you'll be transporting should preferentially be Port Hardy. And that choice is made in conjunction with uh, Island Health um, because if we start splitting our traumas between the two centers, McNeil and Hardy, we start to run into, you know, you, it's easy to split the services, so to speak, or if you needed to put some additional service in for one hospital, it's a lot easier to put it in for the one hospital than it is for both. And for that reason, Port Hardy has been selected as being the, uh, the trauma destination. Now, that might not be terribly um, new way of doing things, but I think we need to reiterate that we're trying to focus the trauma in specific areas. And if more trauma or all the trauma is going to one area, then Island Health can devote more resources to uh, trying to bolster their response to that trauma as well. So again, we're talking about huge areas, obviously on this map, you know, it's like a giant chunk of land that you guys are dealing with up there and um, my hat's off to you. So it's a long way to go. Uh, Hardy is, is the place to go. For Alert Bay and Swantula, obviously you guys aren't going to do too much different. An air response would be wonderful, but is unlikely. So the usual transport mechanisms would apply. But again, early communication, you never know what's going on. And please, everybody in the north, remember early fixed wing activation. And don't be afraid to ask for that because a crew can start to be scrambled out of Vancouver or wherever they might happen to be on a fixed wing to start their way up to Port Hardy Airport. So it's definitely worthwhile communicating that and mentioning that you do have it, especially when you meet those physiological or anatomical criteria and you'll be transporting to Port Hardy Hospital. It just gets the ball rolling way sooner. And of course, ask for help. If you're coming out of Zabalas, you're coming out of Port Alice or something, by all means, get a crew to intercept and assist you on the way. Even if you have a firefighter, it can be helpful to have another paramedic um, <clears throat> intercept you and offer some support. So I would certainly encourage that. And uh, that pretty much uh, wraps up that little tour. Next, we'll just um, jump into a few quick examples and then wrap it up. So taking a quick look at some examples, let's look at this first one where we have a 44 year old male who's ejected from an MVA and uh, he's found with um, some chest and head trauma, blood pressure of 85 on 40, uh, GCS of six and uh, tachycardic. So this patient is located in Beaver Creek, just north of Port Alberni. Traditionally, we probably would have um, loaded that patient up and headed to West Coast General, uh, even if a helicopter was coming most likely. But in this case, if an air response wasn't, wasn't coming because of uh, lack of availability or weather, 
then we would want to head to Nanaimo uh, Hospital for this one, being the lead trauma hospital. And the only reason you would really go to West Coast General is if you had that failed airway uh, scenario where there's no way you can oxygenate or ventilate. So even if you were bagging him or you know something to that effect, head to Nanaimo and be sure to um, check or communicate that some help is on the way and uh, you know look for an ACP or CCP resource out in Nanaimo or another PCP crew if that's not available and uh, head on off. So for our second example, uh, let's say that we have a long fall. Um, young man falls in Yubo, just west of Lake Cowichan. And again, this is a patient that probably would have gone to Cowichan District in Duncan. But if you have this patient, while well, he doesn't meet physiological criteria, um, here we see that he does have a femur fracture, just one, but also an unstable pelvis, and so would fit into the anatomical category of major trauma from the fall. This would um, lead us to think that we should be heading right to Victoria General with this patient. And once again, just like in the other example, for sure, ask for help. You know, an ACP crew out of Victoria to come and intercept, uh, given this long transport time, is 100% reasonable. And of course, you know, notification to them as well uh, to the hospital uh, is important. So that's just two quick examples of, of how this would go. And uh, that's pretty much it. I think we will wrap this up. Well, folks, um, sorry to say, but that's it. Um, if you managed to stick with me through both parts of this video, uh, more power to you. That's awesome. Um, I hope it was a little bit helpful. And of course, I want to encourage everybody to reach out to your practice educators, um, unit chiefs, managers, with any questions or concerns about this trauma stuff, because there's usually a lot of what ifs that come up and people would like to bat this sort of stuff around. So. Um, please engage and ask questions. That's awesome. Um, the practice educators are going to make a point of being out talking about trauma throughout the summer to try to get everyone familiar and comfortable with these ideas. Just remember, um, you know, those, those key things, communicate and, um, you know, ask for help and by all means be self-assured because, uh, you guys got this. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.